Hello, friends. Malk is back for another huge episode of the TV Binge Box. I'm so glad that you can join me. I almost didn't get this one out this week. There's literally, I have just had so much going on. So I apologize that it's late, but thank you for tuning in and subscribing. Nonetheless, it's great to have you here. That is actually probably the best way that you can support the TV Binge Box is get along and subscribe in your favorite uh, uploading, um, you know, kind of subscription podcasty thing. And words are failing me already because it's Sunday morning and I shouldn't be doing this now. Nonetheless, um, make sure that you follow along in all of the social places where you can uh, find them at my link tree, L-A-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Steve Malk. That's all the TV binge box stuff. That's all the TV black, black box stuff and heaven for fend, even my own personal stuff. <gasps> what? I know. Thank you. That's how it works. Uh, if you want to uh, do another huge favor, of course, you can rate and review the podcast wherever you are podcasting or listening from. That helps other people find it. It apparently also pushes it to the top of, I don't know, rankings or something. I know. It's a thing. Uh, this week, sci-fi, comedy, drama, and sport. I mean, what more could you ask for from this guy? Hands up where I can see him. Good gravy, it's Harriet Tubman. The inventor of the bathtub? Uh-huh. Roll it. Oh, hello. Who is this? It's your mama. If you're my mother, what is your last name? Bell. It's my mother. That confirms it. I'm Kublai Khan. Amelia Earhart. The Romanovs. I am Sigmund Freud. And this is my mommy class. <laughs> Master class. What? Who are you? Some call me Jesus Christ, son of God. Some call him broken corny. General Grant, if the North wins, will you go to Disneyland? Well, that depends. Do they have a bar? <laughs> I just can't believe that you're going to betray Jesus. Judas, uh, I know you hear me gonna blow your hands for 30 seconds and you're just not gonna look at me sorry i only have big pieces of silver we are about to embark on the biggest campaign in the history of the world part two no i think we're supposed to get two of every animal i got two chihuahuas two pekingeses two pugs actually i got three pugs don't tell god What ideas have you got for Shakespeare? What if we do a play, but it's got music and singing? People sing their feelings. Someday, the masses will adore me as together we stand tall. Anyone else with a good idea? History of the World Part 2. Yes. So uh, all of this is, of course, based on the original film by Mel Brooks, History of the World Part 1, which I think was nearly 40 years ago that that was released. And um, look, I want to tell you that while there are some jokes in the first part that have not aged well, that's just the nature of comedy changing in 40 years, there's an awful lot in this that... Um, hasn't aged well and it hasn't been released yet. Mm. Look, it, this, it, it, how do I put it? The first film, History of the World Part One, was a 90-minute epic. And so that meant they had to go writing and rewrite and script and edit and all of those sorts of things. History of the World Part Two is eight episodes of 30 minutes. So technically, that's four hours of sketch comedy that really needed an edit. Like to have the discipline of a 90-minute you know, a movie to call it History of War Part Two would have meant that a whole bunch of these sketches would never have seen the light of day. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say that's not a bad thing. There's some funny moments. I want to offer that absolutely. Um, there's a take, Curb Your Judaism, um, which was pretty funny. And and you saw a clip of that in the in the, in the the trailer. Um, there was some other stuff, like there's some great songs, some great laughs. 
there's a few misses and a lot of filler, a lot of stuff that just should have been sliced and diced and not even seen like the performers to have to to put to make happen. So it's just bloated. Um and I say this at like the history of the world part one was formative comedy for me. I absolutely dug it. And what we're getting with this is not that. Um, one of the, I guess, great things is that it has pretty much every comedic actor, pop culture freak, half important person you've ever heard on. Almost all of Hollywood is in this. Um, Taika Waititi, Ronnie Cheng. It's always great to see him pop up as a, as an excellent Aussie comedian. Um, Ike Barinholtz uh, and uh, Wanda Sykes and Nick Kroll are the key executive producers with Mel Brooks. And they actually, those first three, form the first part of the first sketch and pop up through a whole bunch of sketches in the, in the whole thing. Um, Brooks isn't in it much at all. He is an old man, let's be fair. Uh, but we don't, we get to hear his voice. And I think that was part of the draw is that Mel Brooks's comedy was such a central part of what History of the World Part 1 was. History of the World Part 2 feels like he's handed it over to a whole bunch of, you know, great comedic performers and writers to do stuff. And everyone just pitched their script and they said yes. There was no no's in this. If there was no's, God, I'd hate to see what didn't make it. Um, I'm so disappointed because I, re- I was so keenly anticipating this. And because it's sketch comedy, you might think, Mark, you're an idiot. All of it is brilliant. It is seminal. And who could not want to see more of it? Well, you might want to see more of it. And great, good work to, for you if you can. Well done. Well played. I'm not sure that I'm going to go back for the last little bit that I haven't seen because it just kind of got a bit out of control. If you want to watch it, History of the World Part 2 is eight episodes long. They're 30 minutes. And they are being broadcast on uh, the Star Tile on Disney+. Plus. Two episodes a day, starting Monday the 6th of March. So you can tune in on Monday and see the first two eps. Tuesday has the next two eps. Wednesday the next two. Thursday the final two. And if that's your bag, look, check it out and tell me that I'm wrong, please. Because I I wanted to be wrong. And the more I watched it, I was not wrong. So History of the World Part 2. Meh. This next one brings back the Festival of the Boot. Now if I fail, it's going to cost a lot of people their jobs. Hey Terry, Andrew Abdo here. Were you expecting my call? Earlier this morning, the commission approved the addition of the Dolphins. I wanted the challenge, I wanted to do the job, I wanted to be the coach. It's an opportunity to give more young players a pathway through to the NRL. I wanted to come up here, I wanted to play for the Dolphins. Come on, let's get this going here. We've cra- it's crashed. Um, we got absolutely smashed. I've probably struggled a bit more than I've let on. Made no mistake about it, they did a job on us. I expect this last third to go to another level. Can we do that? Would you be against making the four you do? No. Everything we do is to make the game a better sport. It may turn out to be our greatest day. If you'll commit to doing your best, you'll be absolutely amazing in your life what you'll achieve. Dawn of the Dolphins is a brand new documentary landing on stand this Monday, a three-parter, all about the NRL's first new club in 16 years. And it's Queensland's fourth club in the competition, the Dolphins. And it's born out of the Redcliffe Dolphins, which have been a mainstay of Queensland Rugby League for years. And it's certainly been a big part of uh, Queensland Rugby League legend Arthur Beetson, who has long maintained that the Redcliffe Dolphins should have a footprint in the NRL or the national game. And the Dolphins are that. Please note that the difference, the Queensland Dolphins are the QRL team. The Dolphins are the NRL team. Can't have the same name. So they can have the same last bit, apparently, but they can't have the same name. Look, this is um, this is a documentary that I kind of felt a bit weird about. I've only seen the first episode. And all of it is about, of course, the birth of the Dolphins and their push into their very first their very first game in the NRL competition proper, which at time of recording is this afternoon. So if you get to listen to this before that, tune in, check it out. It'll be history in the making. The Dolphins, who will do their best, I'm sure, and probably won't do great this season because it's their first season and first-year teams always struggle. 
I'm sure they will will build a great uh, legacy for for their fans and within the NRL as a part of that. What this documentary offers us is spectacular insight in what it takes to get a club into the modern game as much as uh, what it you know means to have one of the greatest ever rugby league coaches in Wayne Bennett, uh, not only tick, but deeply involved in the process. And what we learned, particularly when they start to talk to um, prospective players and those sorts of things, everybody wants to play for Wayne. Everybody wants to be under his tutelage. He's that good. And, and by his own admission, he's an old bloke now. He didn't have to work, but he wanted to be involved in it because he believed in it. Um, this offers excellent behind the scenes footage and lots of great access and insight and into particularly the administration of the game and what it means to get a bit up as much as run a club, uh, as well as building a club in the middle of COVID lockdown, which they had to do after the bid was approved in 2021. Uh, they then had a lot of stuff that where you would normally meet, it's a very uh, face-to-face personal kind of situation with player managers and players and uh, all of those sorts of things. A lot of that had to transform and go into Zoom, which is not, I mean, that's how we all worked. It's certainly not how they would have been keen to. Um, the difficulty is because it's this push about the birth of the Dolphins through to their first game, and it delivers weekly. So the first episode is this Monday, the 6th of March. Um, uh, yeah, Monday, 6th of March. I, I just felt that the pacing around the episode, the first episode that I saw was all over the shop. It just felt like it went from zero to 90 and stayed there for the whole hour that it was on. It's like, no, chill out. Where's the light and shade? Everything was frenetic. Everything was huge. And I mean, no spoilers. In the first episode, we learned that the Dolphins make it into the NRL. They're the successful bid. So if the next two episodes are about their push to their first game, which is today, are they holding on to that third episode to have a whole bunch of footage from the first game? I guess so. Um, it'll be a great time capsule for the Dolphins as a club, but I just felt that as a documentary, it was just a bit full on. There was no shade to all of its light. There was no slowing down for the curves. It was hitting them at, at full pace. This is absolutely going to be uh, one for the fans and definitely fans of the Dolphins. It's no drive to survive, but it's still a solid sporting documentary. And congratulations to Onion TV who've made this um, for Stan Uh, Long live the Dolphins. May they do well. May they always reign huge uh, and become a big part of what is now the NRL 17 teams in the national competition. Dawn of the Dolphins. There are three episodes. They drop weekly. As I said, the first episode drops on Monday, the 6th of March on Stan. Now, this next series is one I have been hanging out for. I told you once, you could be great, or you can be nobody. To being nobody. This city has suffered a devastating loss. Murderers such as these men have no place in our civilized society. I don't think they did it. The cops round him up, and LA's got themselves the perfect patsies. It's worth fighting for. I just worry that... What? That you're not ready for another murder trial. It's important that Mason knows the price for taking up sides against our city. This case is big. Bigger than you. How's the murder trial of the century going? Now you treat those Mexican boys better than you treat your own son. Mr. Mason seems a bit... ...broken. I don't know how to fight this case. Oh, I know that look. You can't stop your wheels from spinning. We got this one long shot. We could take down some of the biggest names in this city. But nobody... ...is telling me the truth. trial is putting the city on edge. If I find out you're lying, I will. You'll do what? We will not allow you to humiliate a productive member of this city. 
Him or you? Order. They wanted the Wild West, they got it. There is no true justice. There's only the illusion of justice. It's not justice that's an illusion. It's a system. We'll have to ask for a recess. Then we'll need a damn good reason. The judge won't just grant us one. Make something up. Or in that your department? Fair. Oh, it is so great to have Perry Mason back. I loved the first season. I loved that they were trying to give us some kind of insight into where, you know, the great detective play, uh, sorry, lawyer played by Raymond Burr came from. And uh, in the, the, the TV show of the 60s, I guess it was, 50s, 60s. Uh, and this returns us to the ne'er-do-well turned, you know, detective and certainly lawyer Um played by Matthew Reese, and he's still battling his own demons. For those that watched seasons, season one, um, it was a bit patchy because it felt like, well, who's this jerk and what's he doing? And then all of a sudden he's a lawyer. And that was where he really, when he became a lawyer and did the stuff in the courtroom, like that was the Perry Mason that we know and love. And the thing that I really dig about season two is that it doesn't double back. Here's Perry Mason, famous lawyer now, and uh, trying to, to get in there, though he has stepped away from criminal trials and is now focusing only on civil cases, which is thoroughly unfulfilling for him. Uh, as much for anything, because the first case, the Dodson case in season one, just proved to be um, brutal for him. He's still drinking, he's real str still struggling. So why not take LA and why not turn it into a time when uh, the people who had money we're really starting to get their hooks into the place. And this is what we find. The, the, the scion of a powerful oil family is brutally murdered. And, you know, what we what we have is that in the midst of us, a, a Perry, Della and Paul, the, the central three, Matthew Reese, Juliet Rylance and Chris Chalk, are drawn into the centre of that case that opens up conspiracies and, of course, the influence of money on power and all of those sorts of things. And it... it just so delightfully written um, across all of the episodes that you will want to tune in for and check out. It's eight episodes, incredible television. It's moody, LA noir, the soundtrack is sublime, and the devil is absolutely in the detail. You will definitely want to tune in for Perry Mason season two, which you can do without having to have seen season one, though I'd offer there's a few more payoffs if you do. But, you know, your mileage may vary. Check it out. It's delightful. And I, I don't know if you caught in the middle of that um, trailer, Hope Davis, just looking menacing again, doing a brilliant job. She's in, of course, this season of Your Honor, first season and the second season airing currently on stand. Hope Davis is phenomenal, but Matthew Reese is compelling as the, the broken, you know, lawyer who is struggling with his own issues and, and those sorts of things, who is drawn into just wanting justice for people. And you can see it eating at him with some of the stuff that he has to do before he's really able to center himself and find his way in. Perry Mason season two, there are eight episodes. Uh, they run weekly and they start on Tuesday, the 7th of March, uh, 8.30 p.m. on Fox Showcase. And I believe it's also going to drop on Binge. This is going to be eight hours of glorious television. You'll definitely want to tune in for Perry Mason. Now, friends, a final um, series is one that's actually kicked off for, for whatever reason, Disney didn't give us previews this year, but I want to talk to about it nonetheless. Oh, this is the way. Our people are scattered like stars in the galaxy. What are we? What do we stand for? Being a Mandalorian is not just learning about how to fight. You also have to know how to navigate the galaxy. That way, you'll never be lost. I may be 
be forgiven for my transgressions. May the Force be with you! This is the way. There's something dangerous happening out there. And by the time it becomes big enough for you to act, it'll be too late. my goodness the mandalorian is back oh din Djarin and his little mate grogu are live on our screens every wednesday on disney plus and i'm so so glad so stoked these guys are here this season is set up as a redemption story for din as he seeks to rejoin the mandalorians uh after breaking the code which is for those unfamiliar uh, removing his helmet and allowing someone else to see his face part of the um laws of the mandalore is that they put when they're given their helmet they never take it off again in front of someone else in front of another living being so that's I made mean, a bit brutal but that's the life of it so he's seeking to uh, make amends and to rejoin the mandalorians because this is the way oh it's so good the first episode was brilliant and i think has set up an excellent third season in the disney franchise and we have to acknowledge a few things earlier G Gina Carano is no longer a part of the cast because she said things that upset people and Disney went, you're out. So there is a token kind of bye-bye Marshall Cara Dune. Um, she's gone. Uh, there are some great set, set pieces in the first episode. It sets up about four different plots, which I think is going to be great across the episodes that we're going to see play out. And that's what you want. You want to have some intrigue and some draw into this whole process because the Mandalorian has become synonymous with Disney Plus and this return to great storytelling uh, within the, the world of Star Wars and, and on Disney. I I don't buy the criticism that Andor ruined everything from The Mandalorian. They're different shows for a start. And I think that what we're getting from Andor is absolutely intentional in the way they want to tell the story. And goodness, I cannot wait for season two of that next year. Uh, as far as The Mandalorian goes, I think that what we're seeing is a developmental approach. We're seeing that it's it's got a story to tell. It's told it well in the first two seasons. And even it's, let's be fair, it's half of the book of Boba Fett. And what we'll see is a return to some of that. We'll see some of that, that harder storytelling and that um, without it explaining everything, you just have to be involved in stuff. Of course, the first episode has to set some things up, but that's what I'm looking forward to. Andor raised the bar, and I think we're going to see that play out in this third season of The Mandalorian. Rick Fuyama is back as one of the key directors this series. He got a couple of eps in the first season and then ran a fair bit of the second. John Favreau is show running, and I think that that combination, along with all of the other stuff they bring into it, is going to make absolutely all the difference i cannot wait to see what they play out and how they bring it pedro pascal uh, fresh from the last of us returns uh, as the well stern faceless mandalorian dinjarin carl weathers is back he's had a promotion as you'll see uh, giancarlo esposito returns and there is no question what he's looking for as well as omid abtathi uh, amy sedaris and katie sackoff who reprises her role uh, as uh, bo katan and she's not super happy either. So there's heaps that's going to play out in this season of The Mandalorian, and I cannot wait for every single episode. Uh, for those that are unaware, The Mandalorian is set in the Star Wars universe in between Return of the Jedi, which is film seven, the uh, film six, and The Force Awakens, which is film seven. So in that 30-year time frame between those two films, that's where The Mandalorian sits. The Empire have been destroyed, but there's still stuff bubbling along. Um, there's lots of outposts that are a bit wild and woolly and uh there are people like the mandalorian that can make their money as bounty hunters and yet find a bigger purpose and delightful i, I read a story suggesting that john favreau was saying that uh while grogu was off with i won't spoil it for those that haven't seen it but off getting his training if we want to call it that and then he was away for about three years from um din so 
him coming back certainly means that there'll be maybe a little bit more force action from the little green guy. Yeah, come on, The Mandalorian. There are eight episodes. The first episode is out now, along with all episodes of season one and two. Uh, and so season three plays out weekly on Wednesdays on Disney+. Plus. You will want to check out every minute of it because, goodness gracious, may the force be with you. That's it, friends. We're done. That is the end of this week's TV Binge Box. I'm so glad you could join us. Make sure that you check out all the socials at Linktree. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Steve Mulk. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe and rate and review the podcast. It's so good to have you involved. And I'm absolutely digging doing this with you because I'm finding it, it to be a little bit cathartic to be able to talk about the shows that I'm loving and the stuff that I'm watching at length slash ad nauseum. I'm sorry it's late. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of the TV Binge Box family. Um, come along. Join us for the ride. Let me know what you think. Hit me up on the socials or even the TV Binge Box podcast Facebook gang. Um, it would be cool to hear what you think and to know what's going on. I'm your host, Steve Malk, and God damn it, I love television. <laughs>